quantitative data only tell you one side of the story. You go ahead and measure somebody's temperature. You can tell that he's fever, but what is the root cause that this person is having a fever? A lot of people see your ass but they don't want to click or people don't even want to see your ass and they swipe through and that's about it. If you don't speak to your customers, you don't try to understand your customers, the, the numbers can only tell you that, man, that much. Welcome to Data Crunch, where we talk about the ABCD of data science, artificial intelligence, big data, cloud computing, and data science. Now, today we're going to go back to the basics where we're going to talk about how to get a data science job in Malaysia, right? In Malaysia itself. Let's just say I'm someone who loves numbers. I'm a marketer, for example. I've been using platforms like Google Analytics, like Google Data Studio, right? Now, how do I level up from using all these platforms? So if you're already using this platform, it's a good start. You're probably better than 75% of the people out there who do not use any of the analytics tools and make decisions based on you know, gut feeling and guessing already. The next step is to use the data that you have collected from this platform to do something else. Like for example, you can use it to do some what we call supervised learning to make some predictions and forecasting. So you probably want to forecast what are the, uh, the volume of people that is going to visit your blog post what are the number of people who is going to like a particular uh, email, open a particular email when you write. So all this sort of information that you can use to help you to craft better content. If you are coming from a marketing perspective, you can group those subscribers into different groups, that 10, 20 groups, and look at their behaviors. Uh, this particular group of people, they always open our email at certain times and they have a higher conversion rate. Or that particular people, they have a high click-through rate. That means they always open your email and read, but they do not take any actions and you can analyze what's going on. So these are some of the ideas to level up your game. So take me back as though as I'm a beginner. I don't understand what's supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Now with using platforms like Google Analytics, like Google Data Studio, a lot of the data I'm using and a lot of the analysis I'm using is basically quantitative data, looking at data with numbers. But how do I go into that qualitative data side of things and what's the difference between all of them? When it comes to data, people always think like uh, quantitative data is better or qualitative data is bad. The thing is, computers only understand numbers. Or to be exact, right, I always say computers only understand signals 0 and 1. So what we need to do is to convert something that computers don't understand into something that they, they do. For example, if you have a, a photo, you want to analyze the photo, then you have to tell computer that this is a, a 1920 uh, photo, pixel photo with uh, three colors, RGB, different levels, etc. Come back to your use case is that if you are super beginners and you have some qualitative data, then you need to find ways to translate those qualitative data into numbers, into something that the machines can understand. So let's say we run a survey form and ask people to rate how do you think about our surveys, do you have any comments, and we can use that to pick up keywords like uh, people always say, oh good, delicious, yummy, if the service is good, if you're running a restaurant. If people don't like your service, they don't like your restaurants, then they will leave keywords like uh, awful, yucky, expensive, and all these words, they contain uh, sentiments, right? And they have emotional values. So we can set up a dictionary and put these values to those terms. And this is also what we call sentiment analysis, a very useful tool in data science. So a lot of like platforms in the market, uh, as from my point of view as a marketer, are normally quantitative data based where we measure numbers. Like if you go on Facebook, you look at Facebook analysis or YouTube analytics, it's always a lot of numbers. Now, how often do, do you see the industry in Malaysia using qualitative data methods to find out insights for their business? You, you raise up a very good point because quantitative data only tell you one side of the story. Like you go ahead and measure somebody's temperature. You can tell that his fever, if his temperature is over 37.5. But what is the root cause that this person is having a fever? Is it because of some infection? Is it because he just had a workout, you know, or he, he's really sick with flu or COVID? You can't tell. And then you need further diagnosis. So the same thing goes uh, with all those numbers that you have mentioned that is given to us by the platform. A lot of people see your ads, but they don't want to click or people don't even want to see your ads and they swipe through and that's about it. So what we really need to do is to use some tools like 
I mentioned earlier, you can run survey or you have to do somewhat like an observation. So you have to look at like when people interact with you uh, or your other touch points, they send you emails, they leave comments. And that's why you see a lot of YouTubers, a lot of people, they say, oh, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want. And this is the beauty of using qualitative data. If you don't speak to your customers, you don't try to understand your customers, the, the numbers can only tell you that, man, that much. Would you say that qualitative data and the measurement of it would be tougher compared to quantitative data? Tougher to analyze, yes, definitely. That's why it requires special skill sets. Otherwise, you can just throw it into a system and then you generate a model for you. But until today, right, even though we say a lot of good things about artificial intelligence and humans mind, humans brain and our cognitive thinking. So all these factors combined makes it a lot harder to analyze qualitative data. Everybody's perception of good and average are totally different because some people when they go to a restaurant they pay uh, let's say they pay 50 ringgit to get a meal they expect uh, 100 ringgit of service if you don't deliver 100 ringgit of services then they will say oh this is you know below average actually it's not below average it's just below their expectation yeah so that's where the tricky part comes so on the topic of quality data so say I'm a marketer and my, my role as a data analyst in the marketing industry is to find out what our users are talking or what our customers are saying about us in let's say social media and that involves collecting a lot of qualitative data and obviously we can do it manually but what are some ways to automate the whole process and to make it seamless so that it's automated for me and it's easy for me to identify what people are talking about what kind of techniques do we use for that when we want to analyze the sentiments of comments or product reviews, first thing first, we need to write a script to go and gather all those comments. You can use any programming language like Python or R to do that. And you can't use a tool like Excel because Excel is good when you have a lot of numbers. But when you have qualitative data, let's say you have uh, 100,000 comments and you want to split these comments into different keywords and you need to clean up the data, throw away the words that are not useful, that are irrelevant, and extract emojis, emoticon. This is something that's hard. Now, in data science, we have this technique called sentiment analysis, which is we extract the keywords from these reviews, every sentences, and then we look at the keywords that have emotional value. So some of them, let's say uh, love, like, happy, excited, these, will, these keywords will assign with positive values. And then there are some keywords that will assign with negative value, like yucky, awful, ugly, expensive, uh, bad environment, these sort of keywords, right? These are the keywords that we'll assign with negative values. And based on these, and sometimes we can use emoticon sensor or emojis, and we can assess and give a score to the sentence and see, okay, this user, they give a good comments with strong sentiments, they're excited. And then you can look at other people uh, that give bad ratings and bad comments as well, so that you can understand, oh, these are the areas that we did well and the customers really like it, and these are the areas that we didn't do well and we need to improve. If I want to become a data scientist in Malaysia and find a job, I have to be equally equipped to measure quantitative data and also qualitative data. Now, speaking about writing scripts, you mentioned that for qualitative data, especially, uh, and using things like Python and R, normally the road bump or that mental block that many people have when it comes to going to data science because they fear having to program in python and they do not know python they don't come from a tech background is that a very common fear and why a lot of the students that, that come to us right they will say like oh I, I i have zero technical background i don't know programming i don't know scripting uh i i, I don't think i can learn data science effectively right these, these are very very common inquiries i would say and the common fear but what what they, they forgot is that every time when we learn a new language is something that is somewhat excited that, that it's a mixed feeling like excitement with fear because like if I'm going to Japan today and I don't know Japanese language I, I'm excited of course but then I'll be scared like oh, what if 
I'm in the middle of somewhere, I lost my way and I don't know how to speak Japanese and uh, the Japanese people, they don't speak English or Mandarin and what should I do? And to, in today's world, right, it's a lot easier because we have all those apps like Google Translate. And in uh, programming as well, we have a lot of tools that can help you to write your scripts and we have a lot of templates compared to the last time. So this, this fear is, it exists, but it, it can be overcome relatively easily today. So can you recall of a story from someone who went from no background in technology into a data scientist role? I think most of our students who came, right, they don't really have a, a technical background. And uh, let's say Jasmine, she's the one that I, I remember clearly. When she joined us, she's like uh, working as an architect. And then what happened is that uh, she took data science course and then she met a lot of good friends. They joined uh, hackathons together and then she eventually founded her own social enterprise called uh, Matamata, which is a service that helps visually impaired or, or blind people to, to get jobs and they use some data science technique to do the job matching, etc. And then uh, fast forward, today she's working in Food Panda as a performance analyst. So she is a, a classic example that someone who has interest in data and who is able to combine her own skill sets from design, visuals and data analytical skills. And today she got the job that, that she wants. Yeah, so I think, I think this is, this is a, a good example. Now, speaking about our students at LEAD and also going from no tech, tech to data scientists, this recalls uh, an interview we did with another student of ours, Julian, right, who was a marketer and did not have a tech background or a computer science degree as well. But what he really said was that when it comes to programming uh, in data science, especially, you don't have, actually have to use Python, for example, like a programmer because you're using Python for a certain purpose in data science. So there's this expectation that false expectations from new beginners in data science that they have to be like a programmer level to be able to do some processes for data science, but it's really just using the tool and Python is just a tool for that specific task that you want to accomplish in your data science practice. So that's something that if you are watching this video, that's something that you can possibly take in. Now, let's go to the next question here, right? Uh, and I'm going to go a bit more direct to this time here. So since you're looking for a job in data science in Malaysia, now, if I were to ask you a very blunt, straight question, right, uh, Dr. Lau, which industries are best to start in, in Malaysia at least? Uh, would it be a company with a tech company? Or would it be better to go to a company that is from a traditional background and now looking to go into digitalization? Which is better for us? A, a cliche way to say this, right? But a lot of people didn't realize is that the industry that you are in is the best industry to start data analysis or data analytics. Now, you think about this, right? Can you recall an industry that does not use any data or does not plan to use data to improve their companies, you know, operations, sales and marketing, uh, customer management in the next three to five years? Probably not, right? And if that is not the case, any industry is good as long as you are in the industry because you know the industry well, you know the problem, you know the, uh, you have the domain knowledge, so you know what questions to ask and what are the limitations of the way that people are currently analyzing their data. Now, people will have this perception like um, new industry tech startups, they are more open to use technology, which is true. But the problem is that if you join a startup company, they usually don't have that rich amount of data that you can play with. We have a student who joined our daily dashboard workshop last week. He was from an insurance company and he was just an intern, but he is leading the data science department because that insurance company or that insurance company division do not have any uh, data analysts or data scientists yet. So they hire an intern to see or to explore what are the possibilities that they can do uh, using data science. So this is a good sign as well. Although it might sound a bit funny at the very beginning, but that, that is what every company should do, right? If you, if you are not sure how much you should invest into data science, get some interns, help you to explore and get the company into the culture first. So I would say uh, old company, new company or tech-driven company or somebody who is moving into 
uh, digital transformation, it doesn't really matter. The most important thing is they have the mindset and the culture is ready to move forward. Summarize what you have said. It's basically if I want to get a job in data science in Malaysia, what I would do is to work in an industry that I'm excited about and you know yeah. be someone who can find opportunities within a company or within an industry. You don't have to wait for someone to say, hey, we're looking for a data scientist, but you can step up and say, hey, I can do that. I can do this data analytics uh, process, this job, and improve the company process, profits, or even reduce the cost itself. Let's go bluntly to the next question here, okay? So I have my buy-in, I know what I want to do, which industry I want to work in. Now, in the most simplest way possible, how do I get started? So to get started, right, you can always refer to our awesome framework because that is, I, I always emphasize this, this awesome way to guide yourself into the uh, data science project. So you learn, uh, you start by gathering the data, so understand where your data sources are, what type of data sources are there, are they in text form, are they in CSV form, are they in Excel files, or do you have a mini database, SQL database running. And then you clean up the data. Don't rush into building models or anything. Just be friend with your data, get familiar with that. So understand, uh, are there any missing data? How old are the data? How updated are those data? Then only you go and explore the data. Now during the exploratory stage also, you don't have to apply all those fancy advanced models. You basically just use some statistical model to understand uh, the standard things, you know, like average, minimum, maximum, uh, distribution, standard deviations, and to have a statistical feeling of the data set and understand uh, where are the data, what are the data are trying to tell us. Then only you go into the models. And at this stage, make sure that you ask the right business questions. So if you're still watching this video at this point, at this time, you realize that going to data science and getting a job is a lot about your ability to learn quickly and fast, right? And before we leave you with this episode of Data Crunch, I want to share with you some tips to help you learn faster and also more efficiently when it comes to data science or anything else you want to learn in your life, right? So I have three tips to share with you today. Now, the first thing I want to share with you is basically learning is more effective with space repetition. What that means is instead of going and learning like data science, taking like eight hours in a day to you know, brush through all the subjects, all the syllabus in one day, and then expecting to become a data science, scientist, it's better to space that apart. So 30 minutes a day, an hour a day to do that. So that's more effective. It's just like going to the gym. You don't go to the gym one day for 10 hours and expect to become a, a huge, you know, uh, the guest expects immediately. But you go to the gym over space repetition over a few days, few weeks, few months, and that's when you see results. Now, the second thing I want to share with you is basically that learning is state dependent. That means if you are slumped down, you know, your, your shoulders are all down, you're not feeling in, you don't feel excited about data science, you won't be able to learn data science. Now, using the example from Jasmine that Dr. Lau shared earlier, right? Now, she was in that state, particular state that she was interested and excited to learn about data science. And therefore, learning data science became much simpler and more effective for her. Now, the third thing I want to share with you is active learning. Now, what this means is we are all taught to learn very passively in school. When you go to school, high school, right, you sit in class, the teacher teach or lectures in front of the class, and you just passively learn. But what we found with our students through so many programs we have run, through so many workshops we have run, is that learning takes place when you're active when you're doing it actively. And that means instead of just watching a video or watching a lecture, you're actively working on a project and applying what you have learned into practice as well. And that gives you the best way to, to learn something. Now that happens to be something that we do at Data Science Uncut Bootcamp. And the bootcamp itself actually creates this kind of atmosphere, right? It creates this kind of like atmosphere for these three things that happen. Space repetition, because there are lessons every single day. Um, state dependent because people are encouraging you to do the whole thing together from the beginning to the end and of course active learning because you're also practicing every single day and this turns you or turns someone into a data scientist faster than they ever imagined throughout the whole bootcamp itself. Dr. also has a small pdf, a guide basically called the data science interview recipe kit. Uh, feel free to go and get it and basically learn how to get into a data science job in Malaysia. So 
There you go. I hope you found some useful tips and also nuggets from this video of Data Crunch. We'll see you in the next episode, man.